So our next presenter this evening is Sarah Lang. She is the recreation planner for Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. She works in the realm of policy, planning, and collaboration to facilitate stewardship on the forest trails, recreation sites, wilderness areas, and wild and scenic river, rivers. Sarah also supports the Snoqualmie Pass Snowshoe Program. She lives in Everett with a snow-eating two-year-old, two chickens, and an elderly beagle. Her presentation this evening will provide an orientation to the insights and limitations of visitor use monitoring techniques on national forest that are used for estimating backcountry winter use, uh, particularly on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. So uh, thanks for being here, Sarah. Uh, welcome, and I'll uh, let you take it from here. Thanks, Scott. I assume I'm uh, broadcasting. Uh, it looks good on my end, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, so in my work as a recreation planner and uh, recreation manager of the National Forest System, we definitely aspire to use data to inform decision making and how we manage recreation on the forest, uh, where we prioritize investments. but. Um, a little spoiler alert for the presentation, there's not a ton of great data about visitor use on national forests, um, particularly winter backcountry use. Um, this was the alternate title of my talk. I thought it was a little less compelling, so I dropped it. So um, sincere apologies to anyone who wanted real accurate numbers. But um, that being said, I'm gonna share a few thoughts about the importance of visitor use data um, some things we know about, about winter recreation, and um, I will touch on kind of last year, 2020 um, trends and what we were seeing. And um, I'll, I'll wrap up by explaining some of the new methods that we're trying to get at better data about visitation and um, hopefully a ray of, of hope for future uh, talks when it can come with, with, with better info. So just a, a point of orientation, I work for Mount Baker Snoqualmie Forest, which is on the west side of the North Cascades, um, spanning from the Canadian border down to Mount Rainier National Park. So that's about 1.7 million acres, and it is the backyard um, of, you know, somewhere upwards of like 6 million folks, um, including, you know, Vancouver, BC, Seattle metro area. Uh, heavy visitation, we feel the impacts of um, all the people that, that enjoy the outdoors out here. A uh, few thoughts about why visitor data is important from kind of a management perspective. Um, you know, certainly there's just the sheer logistics of, of providing access, which gets even more challenging in the winter. Um, tracking visitor trends and, and volume is important to inform how we do that. Um, there's the experience dimension. And as we know, backcountry visitors are particularly sensitive to the number of people that are getting out um, kind of alters your experience when you're when you're sharing the slopes. Um, safety, increasing visitors is just another factor for kind of assessing um, decisions in in the backcountry and certainly impacts our first responders. And then there's a the stewardship element. You know, understanding the volume of visitors, how they're dispersed across the landscape, is really important information for decision making, planning. Um, for natural resources and directing kind of investments in, in future infrastructure. So um, we know in, in Washington state, it's, it's estimated about 30% of Washington residents participate in re winter recreation, which is just like a nice big number. Um, when you narrow that into backcountry, um, folks that report kind of recreating in undeveloped settings, those numbers get a little bit smaller. Um, about 1%, 2% of uh, residents report, you know, backcountry skiing as, a, as an activity they participate in. Um, it gets a little larger with snowmobiles and snowshoeing. Uh, this is just, you know, a snapshot in time. We don't have trend data uh, specific to Washington state that I'm aware of. This is from Washington Recreation and Conservation Office, but um, a source of kind of national trends and tracking participation rates is, uh, comes from Outdoor Industry Association. 
And I was just going to share a few of their findings that, that are not necessarily specific to winter use, but I think probably apply um, broadly to recreation participation right now. Um, we're definitely seeing nationally, and it, it plays out locally too, you know, more visitation, um, more people getting out, uh, which is great, but uh, the driver for that are those casual visits. So those people that are kind of coming out for one-off um, activities. There's been actually a decline in intensity for visits um, over the last 10 years. So people that are, you know, getting out for two or more times a year, um, those numbers have been going down. Um, and then just average trips per visitors has also been going down. <clears throat> and then some of the demographic disparities that, um, you know, in terms of uh, who's, who's reporting participation in outdoor recreation compared to our general population disparities in racial, ethnic, um, income, and gender um, persist. So, you know, pivoting to thinking about what happened in 2020, um, a year of exponential growth in a lot of ways, um, certainly saw a lot more people outside. The data reflects that. Um, again, looking at Outdoor Industry Association data, uh, they captured a, an uptick in um, new people coming, coming out for Outdoor Rec, and we certainly saw that locally. And initial kind of surveys suggest that about a quarter of these new participants um, report that they may not continue their new activities. Uh, there's speculation that that could continue as you know life rec returns to normal, so-called. Um, but regardless, I think we've got an, a ton of new people that have invested some amount of energy and time and, and money into gear and to learning about the outdoors. And I think we're kind of seeing this upward trajectory continuing. On, on National Forest in 2020, we saw an overall like 12% um, increase in, in visits compared to the prior year. But that was really like most, most concentrated on like backcountry settings, wilderness settings. Um, you know, of course, we had a lot of closures of campgrounds. There were, you know, ski area closures and delays. And um, so that those developed settings were not always as available. But I think we saw people just trying to get out further, trying to get away, trying to get out of their, their house. Um, and so looking at just wilderness areas, congressionally designated wilderness areas, uh, visits increased by like 75% um, from the prior year in 2020. Um, and other kind of non-wilderness backcountry settings, dispersed settings was like 40%. Um, noticeable, you know, huge influx of folks. Um, you know, we don't have the data right now for, for how that played out so far this year, but, you know, observations from the field are that it's, it's busy, but it isn't 2020 busy. Um, so some of that might have been kind of a blip. Um, Looking at snow park sales in, in Washington, you know, this is kind of the, the one of the main ways that a lot of folks get out in the winter. Definitely saw a big uptick in, in those seasonal and one-day passes and groom trail passes. I also looked at the snowmobile registration data, and it, I think that there were quite a few stimulus checks that went into new sleds. Um, there was like a 5,000 uh, snowmobile, uh, 5,000 increase in a new snowmobile registration. So that data does vary a lot year to year. So I don't put a lot of weight in it, but um, I, I think it's fair to say there's some new entrants into winter recreation um, spawned by the pandemic. So a little bit about the challenges of keeping track of visitation and um, some of the ways that we do it. The, the primary method for national forests nationally is the national visitor use monitoring effort. And that happens on every national forest every five years. Um, the, the method is the, are these intercept surveys. So you might be driving along a forest road and, and get flagged down, invited to participate in a survey. Someone might come up to you with a clipboard at you know, a ski area, campground, trailhead, and um, that's kind of the, the census, you know, the survey method to reach folks. Um, like any method, there's going to be bias in terms of who responds and who 
um, answers those surveys. There's also kind of the random site selection and date selection it tends to, to favor developed areas that may, may or may not capture um, activities that are really, you know, dependent on very specific terrain and very specific conditions that are maybe less random. Um, so NVOM National Visitor Use Monitoring gives us a picture of kind of general forest use. It's, it doesn't tell us much about specific sites. I would say for, for activities where the, it doesn't really give us a picture of backcountry use really period, um, at least for winter um, and, and skiing and snowboarding specific. That being said, um, our, our most recent year for NVM was 2020, and we had to kind of throw that out the window because we weren't able to do the surveys. Um, so we have the last two years of data on the forest on Mount Baker Snoqualmie, um, also happened to be poor snow years. And so, you know, ski visits um, with developed ski areas were grossly underestimated where we might normally have 1.5 million. So even in like a developed ski area, which is like probably the easiest place to count people because everybody's buying a ticket, um, you know, this, this methodology doesn't fully capture the use and the demands um, on the forest. But good news, there's more data out there. Um, so for the last six years or so, we've been partnering with the out, uh, University of Washington Outdoor Recreation and Data Lab to develop new methods of estimating use. And right now, um, this work is really focusing on trail use, trail-based recreation, and the model is not performing well at, at, at like estimating winter use. And I'll try to get into why that might be, but um, this is taking kind of a variety of data sources. So, you know, on-site data, um, and that's like county people with infrared sensors, um, game cameras, which is that method kind of got dropped. It's really time intensive and captures a lot of weird stuff that's not relevant. Um, and then counting, you know, just counting vehicles at parking lots. Um, it includes a variety of data from social media. And so this is publicly shared information um, on platforms like, you know, Flickr, Twitter, and Instagram. So that would include geo, geo tagged photos that are shared. Um, so, you know, there's metadata that's associated with, with photos when we share them and tag them, um, assign them to places that includes like the date of the visit, the location. Um, and then we're also pulling from platforms where, where people are reporting information about trips. And so that can include like all trails, eBird is a new one, um, Washington Trails Association. And then there's like the citizen driven component, which is we have signs at a multitude of trailheads that capture, uh, that invite people to respond by text uh, to a phone number and let, let us know how many trails or how many cars in the trailhead parking lot um, and to the extent that you are willing to engage with the robot. Um, you know, it, 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 there's a kind of a survey component. And so um, also quickly, we're, we're not using Strava data, but I think it's fun to look at, but I wanted to point it out because there are other land managers that are employing um, similar types of like social media data to try to understand visitation and Strava is more of a, a popular one. It's a pay for service kind of thing. We are, our model, you know, uses kind of publicly shared, publicly available information right now. Um, but, you know, you can get an idea of like winter use and, and where, people might be on the land um, and this one's fun that you know baker routes in the winter but um anyhow so so we get this input from geolocated geolocated data that's um scraped i can't really speak to the technicalities i'm not the one doing the, the behind the scenes stuff but um that data gets assigned to a specific route um in this case there's a trail that accesses this terrain um, and there's, you know, a, set, a certain set of assumptions that are made about um, where people, you know, people are using a, a trail to get to an area. And so there's cross country travel and destinations that are kind of associated with that trail. And all that data gets assigned to the trail and feeds the model. Um, so the the model for visitation, you know, it, it, it incorporates real live on site counts when we have them. 
um, <clears throat> the social media data. And for any given set of social media data, there's all sorts of biases and gaps of information that, that are inherent in them. Um, I can't get into the weeds on that. But the theory here is that by like drawing from a diversity of sources, it helps kind of build out a more robust picture. Um, we factor in information about weather on any given day. Um, precipitation's a, a variable that tends to affect visitation to a degree, um, certainly the day of the week. And there are also kind of like site-specific attributes that get fed into the statistical model. Um, and then the output is this, uh, I, so I should have made this a little bigger, but um, we have this, this visitation model that, that tracks really, really nicely with actual on the ground observations of actual use on trails. And um, it doesn't always align so beautifully. There's certainly outliers and places where it's, it's a lot more challenging to get an accurate estimate. But the goal and the hope here is that, you know, we can get better, Kind of predictive abilities and an and ability to kind of estimate at a site specific and even like you know spatial and temporal scales that are a lot more fine um, than our current tools allow and help us see change over time help us you know predict use and, and you know could inform a lot of different types of uh, decisions and planning and could maybe help you as a user select an area that's less busy um, you know Changing this or, you know, approaching this for modeling winter use is going to have to take a lot more um, or it's going to have to look at, right, the, the input for the data, um, adjusting how those polygons are drawn um, to account for winter routes. There's a lot of work that would need to be done and fine tune, I think, to, to, to get better accurate winter use estimates, but um, I think there's a lot of promise. So um, you can help with this when you're out on the forest. If you see these signs um, at the trailhead and you'll see them on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie, but also at certain sites on the Okanagan Wenatchee, I believe um, this methodology is also being used right now, like up at Washington Pass to try to understand visitation patterns um, in the enchantments, um, other different locations throughout um, Okanagan Wenatchee, I'm not fam as familiar with where they're employing it. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're up for it, text the number of cars you see, you can engage with the robot, um, fill out the survey. Uh, we always appreciate the data and the help um, in terms of getting a better idea of visitation. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll stop here. If, if there are any questions, ideas, or if anybody has any data, <laughs> we would love it. Um, Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's that's awesome. It's um, it's actually really interesting. Just the, you know, how, you know, the lack of of actual user data we have in the winter across across our area. It's a it's it's actually a bit of a challenging um, aspect for us for our operation. Uh, and I know Dennis is going to talk. Uh, in his talk, in a little bit around you know what we saw like uh, for website use because that's a you know, probably one of our better proxies for <laughs> for use, but it doesn't quite tell us, you know, really what we want to know. But, um, you know, we saw a big uptick last year in, in just our website traffic, in particular on the Avalanche forecasting page. Um, one question I had just I thought it was really interesting, you know, the you mentioned that um, there's fewer trips by individuals and then there's a, you know, declining, um, I can't remember what you call it, declining visitation or declining um, term. Intensity. Yeah. Intensity. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have do you have any thoughts as to why that is? Is it just that we're there's so many of the people that are going outside these days are doing many other things, and that is we're it, all just so tapped yeah. for we're we're in all we're into all kinds of things. <laughs> it's a great question. I I and it's a good one for a social scientist to take a look at. Um, probably you're onto something there, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more competing for our time. Um, and it, it, it could be that just the sheer volume of kind of new entrants that are, that are just dropping in are kind of washing out the effect of, of the more intense users. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's interesting. I also really appreciated your, uh, your photo of the, the Hayek clover leaf this winter. That was a, 
for those of us that I think uh, experienced that, that was quite an experience this year for the first time. I bet, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, here's one from uh, Kyle Johnson. He's he's asking, how can backcountry users influence data in our favor, i.e. more winter access at more places, uh, when we don't buy lift tickets uh, and we show up um, and leave and like to keep our spot secret? So I guess the question is like, <laughs> you know, for, for backcountry users like snowshoers or skiers or split boarders, um how can we you know how can we be registered as as actually out there and 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 um and, and frequenting the forest or whatever so as to you know have an advocacy role in yeah access? great question and um you know i i definitely also want to acknowledge i think that for good very good reasons there's a movement towards discouraging tagging your locations right like because mm -hmm. we're yeah. there's as much as you know i'm trying to shine the light on like well social media can be used for for some useful purposes i think we all have seen the effects of too many tags driving people to places they either don't belong or right, right? like you know mm -hmm. uh, anyway um, I don't need to belabor that, but um, I think I think that like having an impact is going to have to happen in a, a different way. You know, just going it's just going out and um, showing up isn't isn't going to do it. And so it's like um, you know, advocating. I, I'm not allowed to, <laughs> to to advocate as a federal employee right now, but um, you know, let let your reps know uh, what's mm -hmm. important to you, and you know, specifically when you're you know, if it's, if it's parking, if it's, you know, um, plowing or you know, I don't know, whatever the, the access challenges are, if you have them, or if there are specific kind of, you know, infrastructure investments or, or, or things that you see that are important um, to kind of maintaining access and um, getting out there, then I think it's going to take just more than showing up and, and the data doesn't really mm -hmm. tell the full story. We need people kind of speaking out. Advocating for their own access. Yeah. 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 Um, question from uh, Scott here. Do you, do you utilize any like Gaia uh, GPS recorded public track data, Gaia or CalTOPO, any of those sort of softwares? That's, are you plugged yeah, into those? That's a good question. Um, the, the statistical model doesn't draw from those because I don't, you know, I don't know if how what kind of metadata is associated with those tracks, but I have, I've definitely, as a rec planner, have looked at mm -hmm. that data, try to understand like cross country use and where people are going. Mm -hmm. um, I look at Keltopo to understand that. Um, so, right. it, you know, that's just kind of another way that we try to um, key into user generated data that's shared. It's a, it's really helpful. Yeah. Another question from uh, from Colin Johnson here. Um, from a stewardship perspective uh, and a human impact on flora and fauna, um, is it true that uh, winter users are less damaging to the forest as a whole versus summer uh, users? Trade, you know, for being on trail and camper camping and so forth. Do we do we have any idea there? Do we know? There's there is literature out there um, that discusses different different types of impacts on different um, species, and I think it varies. You know, certainly between motorized and, and unmotorized. Although sometimes it's the the unmotorized user that can spook animals um, more because we can sneak up on them. Um, so there's that mm -hmm. dimension. I, it kind of depends. I've what, seen that yeah. study before. It's an interest. It's kind of <laughs> yeah. counterintuitive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to say, you know, is it better or is it worse? I think there's a lot of nuance depending on what you're concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I said we're certainly, we get questions um, about about visitor use and, you know, from from the angle of concern about wildlife and range and, and mm -hmm. potential impacts. Um, the, the data and the correlation between rec use and, and wildlife populations isn't always very clear, but that's mm -hmm. my real vague answer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Complicated. Have you, yeah. Have you all seen any sort of uh, increase in uh, trailhead break-ins uh, during the pandemic? Oh, uh, that would be a, Samuel. Yeah, that would be a good data point. I'd have to ask like the sheriffs about that. 
I, you know, my, my theory would be that maybe there were less just because there were so many people out there. Um, mm. But I don't know. I really don't know. You know? There's, yeah. there's a lot of break-ins out there, <laughs> especially in certain areas. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, question from Justin here. Have you looked into asking for cell tower data for, you know, for areas that have coverage? Um, has that been talked about? <laughs> It's been looked at, you know, I know the, the team at University of Washington um, has explored, there are, there's data for sale. Um, there's a lot of data for sale and that's, that's one of those sources. It's, I, I've looked at information that's been gleaned from, I think Snohomish County used the cell tower data for some tourism and, and outdoor rec planning. And it's just, it's kind of crazy, right? Like they can, they have very, clear um, pictures of like where individuals travel and where they're from. And um, it's very expensive. It feels to me, just, it feels a little different than just, you know, um, working with information that people have shared publicly. Um, so I just, I don't know from the ethics angle, but I think also it just isn't sustainable. Like one of the objectives for this whole project is to try to find ways that we can get better data and better estimates, um, you know, in the way that's financially sustainable, that doesn't require a lot of labor. Um, and that yeah. hopefully is like generated by people voluntarily, ultimately. Yeah. So maybe you, there, like there could be an app that you turn on and we can track you, but. <laughs> I'm sure there's know. some uh, app developers <laughs> listening right now that maybe want to reach out and help. <laughs> yeah. Send me an email. <laughs> there we go. Well, there's so many, I mean, this is a great conversation and it's, I think it's such a critical conversation around, you know, you know, anyone who's, who's interested in getting outside uh, in our mountains in the winter, I think access has become a, a challenge and uh, trying to figure out the path forward. I think, uh, you know, in the post COVID era, I think is there's, there's a lot to do here. Um, you know, even the Northwest Avalanche Center is is looking into options around advocacy and and trying to trying to figure out you know what what a role that the Northwest Avalanche Center could perhaps play in the in the backcountry space. Yeah. Um, it's complicated, and I, I really appreciate all the work you're doing, Sarah. And uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, and um, thanks for thanks for all the insights and your presentation.